What is up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul where we talk about the problem but focus on the solution. And if you're new to my channel, my channel is all about mental health. So if you're like me trying to improve your mental and emotional well-being, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And real quick, if you missed yesterday's video, I did a video on the nine major differences between the depressed brain and the average brain. So make sure you go check that out. That'll be linked up in the info card as well as in the end screen. All right, so before we get started uh, on answering the question, are you addicted to depression? Am I addicted to depression? Are other people addicted to depression? I wanna make it very clear, I am not a therapist, I am not a psychologist, but you know who is? This guy. Now, the prefrontal cortex, that youngest part of our brain from an evolutionary perspective, it understands on an intellectual level that we shouldn't smoke. And it tries its hardest to help us change our behavior, to help us stop smoking, to help us stop eating that second, that third, that fourth cookie. We call this cognitive control. We're using cognition to control our behavior. All right, that is Dr. Judson Brewer. I just finished uh, reading his book, The Craving Mind, for a second time. Absolutely love that book. I'll link it down in the description. Phenomenal book. Just, just, go, just go get it, all right? Like, everybody's like, like into like books like Habits and stuff. Like there's this book that is just like a bestseller, The Power of Habit. I think this book is a thousand times better, doesn't get nearly enough love. Anyways, in his book, he uh, cites some research. And I just learned about this study about people who are addicted to depression. And my brain just went <laughs> So we're gonna be asking and hopefully answering the question, are we addicted to depression and trust me baby I know all about addiction so those of you who don't know me I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic but a lot of us have addictive behaviors um, we're gonna be diving into addictive thoughts right but we often don't recognize it so let's start let's start with the basic definition of addiction okay just get the the words drugs and alcohol out of your mind just the basic definition of addiction it's a continued use or action despite negative consequences, all right? So we might be addicted to something if we keep doing it even though it's negatively affecting our lives, all right? Lock that in, we're gonna circle back to it towards the end of this video. So first, let's talk about rumination real quick, all right? So rumination, a lot of us struggle with rumination, a lot of my rumination, like, <laughs> baby girl, I ruminate like nobody's business. I remember a car ride home from California and at least two or three hours of that four hour drive, I had the same thought, just over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Like, on average, did you know we have about 70 to 80,000 thoughts, all right? And I think uh, it's about 90% of them are about the same thing. Like, isn't that crazy, all right? But anyways, they found that rumination is often linked to depression. So although depressed people may not like their depressive thoughts and the rumination behind them, there is a possibility that we are addicted to them. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at this research study that's titled, Sad as a Matter of Choice, Emotion Regulation, Goals in Depression. So let's read the abstract real quick. Research on deficits in emotion regulation has devoted considerable attention to emotion regulation strategies. We propose that deficits in emotion regulation may also be related to emotion regulation goals. We tested this possibility by assessing the direction in which depressed people chose to regulate their emotions, i.e. towards happiness or towards sadness. In three studies, clinically depressed participants were more likely than non-depressed participants to use emotion regulation strategies in a direction that was likely to maintain or increase their level of sadness. This pattern was found when using regulation strategies of situation selection, studies one and two, and cognitive reappraisal, study three. The findings demonstrate that maladaptive emotion regulation may be linked not only to the means people use to regulate their emotions, but also to the ends towards which those means are directed. So basically, they got two groups of people. Depressed people, non-depressed people. And they showed them a set of happy, sad, or neutral pictures, 
okay? Then they gave them the choice to see that picture again or a blank screen, all right? And then after that, they rated their moods. So what they found across the board uh, between depressed and non-depressed people is happy images made people happier. Sad images made people sadder. No surprise there. Now, what they also found was depressed people decided to look at the happy images again as much as the non-depressed people. But here's the kicker. Depressed people chose to look at the sad pictures more often than the non-depressed people, okay? They wanted to look at the sad pictures. So scientists, in order to confirm a study and its results, what they'll do is they'll run it over and over and over again. And sometimes what they'll do with those results, they're like, hold on, let's, let's try hitting this from a different angle and see if we get the same results. So they ran the exact same study, but instead of pictures, they used audio clips, right? Or um, sound bites from pieces of music. Happy music, sad music. Do you wanna listen to it again or do you not wanna listen to it again? Boom, same thing happened. Depressed people wanted to listen to the sad music again, all right? Now here was the most fascinating part to me, okay? The third time they ran this study, they gave people different coping skills, all right? That would either help decrease their sadness or increase their sadness, all right? So think about it as being handed one of two options. Here's a healthy coping skill, here's an unhealthy one. And what they found is nuts. They found that depressed people were more likely to use the unhealthy coping skills that they already knew beforehand would make them feel worse. Now, to the average person, a lot of this makes absolutely no sense. But if you're like me and you've struggled with depression, like, this makes a ton of sense, right? Like, we do these things. like. How many times when we're sad do we listen to a bunch of sad music? How many times do we watch sad movies when we're feeling down, right? Like, they're making us feel worse. And it makes sense to us. And one of the reasons why they think that might be is because it's comfortable, all right? It's like the perfect fitting glove or piece of clothing. Like, we know it fits. We know what our depression feels like and we know that we can sit in it, right? So again, remember the definition of addiction, continuing an action despite negative consequences, all right? So we continue to do unhealthy things or ruminate on unhealthy thoughts or listen to music or watch sad TV uh, shows or movies, right? We continue to do those things even though those make us feel worse. If you ask me, that seems to tick a few boxes on the old addiction checklist. So one of the major problems is that for a lot of us, our depression becomes part of our identity, right? We have this fixed mindset of this is me, I am a depressed person. Something that has helped me and what a lot of different forms of therapy do is it helps you realize that your depression is it's a feeling, it's an emotion, right? And even though you might have uh, different uh, imbalances with your brain chemistry, we identify so closely to it that it's hard to let it go. For some of us, if we're being honest to, with ourselves, if we stopped being depressed, who are we, right? So that might be part of why we're addicted to it. Like, just to give a great example of like my addiction, like one of the reasons I was afraid to get sober was if I'm not the drunk, party guy, who am I, right? So without even realizing it, we might be holding ourselves back and latching on to unhealthy coping skills, right? And for some of us, when we say, oh, therapy didn't work or this or that, right? Well, maybe, maybe it's because we're choosing not to do the healthy coping skills because we're addicted to our depression, all right? So the first step towards solving any problem is recognizing that there is a problem. All right, so hopefully now that we have some clarity about this situation, we can stop being so damn addicted to our depression and start getting into that solution. All right, but anyways, that's all I got for this video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And don't forget, check out the last video if you haven't yet, the nine major differences between the depressed brain and the average brain. 
All right, and a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel over on Patreon, as well as everybody who supports the channel by buying the mental health books at TheRewiredSoul.com or the merch from the merch store. All right, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.